I wanted to come back and do a, I was going through my videos yesterday and one of my earlier videos that I had done was the boy in the box. And for those of you who may have watched that video, I went with the theory and I was kind of leaning toward the theory that this M or Martha as she was known, this woman who was a scientist, she was a, a farm she worked for a major pharmaceutical company. She had a PhD. At no point during her lifetime had any had there had been no break in her work history, there had been no break in her education history that would suggest that she had had any kind of mental breakdown or lapse that had her hospitalized. She started seeing a psychiatrist and um, she told the story that her mother had bought a little boy when he was around two years old and had him for around two years and murdered the child in a fit of rage that the child had been abused the entire time that he lived with them. Um, now, I want... A lot of people said to me, and I had people come onto my comments and say, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, it was... It came out last year, or earlier this year, that DNA, through DNA, working, they had they had uh, exhumed the child's body. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this story, let me give a little recap real quick. This little boy's body, he was... Uh, they didn't know exactly how old he was at the time of his death. His body was found wrapped in a blanket in a cardboard box in the woods in Philadelphia in 1957. And no one came forward. The police um, did everything that they could. They put out flyers. They sent flyers out with people's gas bills and and just ask the community, does anyone know where this child came from? And over the years, the child was buried in a potter's field, like in a public cemetery, um, with just a headstone that read, a uh, boy in the box. And over the years, um, the cold case detectives came back and they started working, trying to come up with something. And as DNA became an advancement, they used that technology and eventually, they were able to find the boy's parents, birth parents. Now, the story of Martha, she tells the story that her, her mother was a librarian and worked for the high school and the university there in town. Her father was a high school science teacher and uh, had scientific papers published. He... They both worked for the university. They were well known. They were connected. Um, and she claimed that she was sexually abused, physically abused. That the little boy was also. She said the child went by the name of Jonathan. And that her mother had bought the little boy. That she remembered going with her mother when she was probably around 11 or 12 years old. To a house and the mother gave this man some money and she brought the little boy home. The child it turned out had some developmental issues and he became just an abuse victim and her story was that on the night that he died um, the mother had fed him baked beans, and he got sick and threw the baked beans up. The mother became angry and started to beat the boy, and um, he had the vomit on him, and she told the daughter, who was around 14 at the time, take him upstairs and give him a bath, cut his fingernails. When they found the child's body, his hair had been cut in places that it looked like someone had attempted to cut off maybe matted her or clumps of her and um, the fingernails were freshly cut and it did look like that his fingers were um, wet or like the skin was wrinkled as though it had been in the water. So the police actually, now th keep in mind this was 1957 when he was found. It wasn't until the 90s 
when this woman came forward with this story many many years later and um, she had told the story to her psychiatrist and they said that they believed the story was credible but they couldn't confirm it and they had no way of finding any of this out because both of the parents by this point were dead I believed her story to be credible. The fact that she said that the child had been fed a dinner of baked beans and he had thrown up. The police said when he was found they did an autopsy that he had undigested baked beans still in his stomach, which would mean that he had died sometime within an hour or two, or a couple of hours of having ate this food. There was also residue of vomit in, in his esophagus. His fingernails were freshly cut. There were clumps of hair cut off of his head. And he was badly, badly beaten. He died from blunt force trauma. He had bruising to his head as though he had been beat in his head. And this was the story that this woman told. Now, unless she had access to someone within the police force who told her some things that had not been released publicly, how did she know this? Now, I had a lot of people say to me, that's just a made-up story. The police said they couldn't confirm her story because she had a mental illness. This woman, keep in mind, like I said, she went to college, she went, she went to graduate school, got her Ph.D., she worked for a major pharmaceutical company. She traveled around the world. She lived in both the United States and Europe. She had a good career, and at, like I said, at no point in her lifetime was there any indication that she had missed work or missed her, her job or missed her education due to any kind of mental illness. And nobody that knew her ever said, oh, yeah, she was you know mentally ill or, or had this this mental disease the fact that she was seeing a psychiatrist and was being treated does not necessarily mean that she was mentally ill i think that what in my opinion and, and this story may not even be related at all it could have even been a different child you know it could have been a completely different child and the story could also have been made up which is very coincidental if it was but the the my my theory was is that if she was seeing a psychiatrist, it was because that finally, after so many years of carrying this story and suppressing this, that it took a toll on her, and that she wanted to tell this, and pretty much she was dismissed. After DNA testing became a thing, and they started putting the child's DNA. They built a profile of the child, and over the years, they were able to find some matches, and this eventually led them to siblings of the child on his mother's side. Now, this is where the story begins, um, the update. Murray Elizabeth Betsy Abel graduated from high school in Dobbins High School in Philadelphia, in 1949. Now the child, the little boy in the box, was later identified as having been her child that she gave birth to in 1953 when she was 21 years old. The child was named Joseph Augustus and the father was listed on his birth certificate and his name was The father, through DNA, was identified as Augustus John Sorelli, who was also from Philadelphia. As far as any of the siblings and the living relatives of these two knew, no, the father, it's possible that the father never knew of the little boy's existence. He may have been told at one point that she was pregnant and Maybe she told him she was going to give the child up for adoption. He never indicated to his children, his, his the woman that he ended up marrying and having a family with through the years, 
At no point had he ever told anyone that he had a child out there. And they believe that it's possible that he never knew that he had this child. They weren't sure how the two had met because he was five years older than her. And according to some of her family members, she had had a daughter when she was 18 years old that she had also put up for adoption. Now, I don't know if the family's been searching for that daughter to find out who she may be and uh, what may have happened to her. But she has this child. She puts him up for adoption. And then she ends up marrying a man that she um, was seeing named John Plunkett. Uh, Betsy, as she was known, gave birth to the child when she was 21. She was unwed. This was 1953. And she gave the child up for adoption. Um, went on with her life. She got married. She ended up having four children with her husband. She spent her life working in um, factories and warehouses in Philadelphia. And she died from lung cancer that they say was probably brought on from asbestos exposure from having worked in these warehouses. Jo um, Augustus Sorelli, the boy's biological father, he went on to start and work in construction business and build a, a, a successful construction business and career. He married and had several children with his wife. And like everyone said, now, the families. The story the families tell is that they learned of this child's existence or their connection to him two or three days before the police made a public announcement that they had found his identity. Gus, as he was known, was the, the child's birth father, biological father, um, Augustus Sorelli, and was went by the name Gus, was a concrete and stone mason, and he was from West Philadelphia. They conceived a child together in the spring of 1952, and the boy's short, painful life became one of Philadelphia's greatest unsolved mysteries. For nearly 66 years, police and the community did not know the child's name. He was known only as the boy in the box. But thanks to DNA advancements, they were able to come up with his family. Now the relative says that they believe that the children, both the girl and the boy that she gave up for adoption, three years apart, were both handled by a Catholic, private Catholic adoption agency. And many people have, have speculated at that time there were homes for wayward girls, as they were known. And they believe that it's possible that she may have gone there. What they would do is, when the families of these teenage girls or young unmarried women would find out that they were pregnant, they would send them to these homes and they would stay hidden away during the duration of their pregnancy. And upon giving birth, the children would be adopted and the girls would be sent on their way and according to some people who had family members who went through this process these girls were treated very very badly they were beaten they were practically starved and they were mistreated and they were treated as though they were there it was almost like a jail because they were bad girls they were being punished for having gotten pregnant out of wedlock and um, I very much believed that a lot of this was covered up and hush-hush due to that, due to people not wanting their name out there, due to maybe who raised, or, or I won't say who raised the little boy, but the woman that supposedly bought him from this adoption agency or whoever it was, someone maybe adopted him. And when they found out that the child had developmental issues, maybe 
They didn't want the child anymore, so they sold him. I don't know. But I, it's just another theory, and it's kind of all this conspiracy, you know. Here's the thing that the police and everyone in the area are really confused about, or not confused about, but question. When this child's body was found in 1957, she had to know that there could be a very good possibility that could be the baby that she gave up for adoption. Did she ever think that? Or did she just put it behind her and go on with her life? And when the story broke, and it was big news all in the area, did she ever once wonder and nobody knows if she did or not she may have said something to someone but then again did her husband that she married did he even know that she had had a child or two children had she told him this you have to sit and wonder that as the story was out there in the news and for so many years did she ever think to come forward and say but keep in mind in the 1950s DNA was not a thing at that time and uh, the child was born and in a hospital apparently or at least he was born in his birth certificate she named his father to the birth certificate they were able to find this birth certificate and this is what led them to start doing DNA testing on the siblings and this is how they found out that, yes, indeed, he was their child. So no one stepped forward to identify him when his body was discovered in 1957. On December the 8th, 2022, police announced the boy's name for the first time, saying that DNA evidence from both the maternal and paternal sides, along with the birth certificate, Police said at a news conference that the boy lived around 61st and Market Street and that they had their suspicions about who was involved in his life and his final days. They didn't publicly name the parents. The Sorelli name is uncommon in Philadelphia. The media, along with internet sleuths and genealogists, quickly discovered the small, tight-knit family in the region. Gus Sorelli's four children have not responded to repeated requests for comment, but a Westchester attorney representing them said in a statement that both Gus and his family have been attacked on social media outlets, and they, they claim that they never knew of the child um, having been related to them. Um... Like I said, Gus, the father, had not married when this child's body was found. He had not even gotten married at that point and started his family. So all of these children that he had came along years later. They may have heard stories about the boy in the box as it was a big mystery in Philadelphia, but they never had any reason to think that he was their sibling. The children are sympathetic to the death of this young boy and horrified by the events. However, until recently, they had never heard about any of this. And they never had any indication that their father or any family member had anything to do with this. And what, what his birth or his adopted name became... If the police have that information, they have kept it quiet as, as of right now. Um, Gus Sorelli's niece submitted DNA that matched Joseph's. So they were able to match the little boy's DNA to a cousin. Before that, Betsy's relatives had uploaded their DNA for research. A forensic genetic genealogist and cold case liaison helped to build Betsy's extended family tree. 
Eventually, police came knocking on doors to talk to her relatives. Now, I wonder this question. Did her children ever know that they had two siblings out there that had been adopted out? Did they learn of this through their mother, or were they ever told about this, or maybe in later years after she got older and became sick? They said that she suffered an extended illness and died from lung cancer due to asbestos exposure. So maybe during that time when she knew she was very sick and going to die, maybe she told her children about their two other siblings. I don't know. Did anyone in the family ever talk about these other two children? Maybe this is the reason why her children put their DNA in to be researched. Maybe they were looking for their siblings. According to the close relative of Betsy's who wanted to remain unidentified, the family only learned about their connection to the boy in the box two days before the police made the announcement publicly. So this, they, they show up and they say to these people, this little boy who was murdered and beat to death and left in the woods naked in a box um, 66 years ago was your brother. So they had to take all this in and then it's put out there to the to the world through a news conference and this only gave them a, a two days to even prepare themselves mentally that this was their brother and then they have to deal with all these people coming after them saying well what did you know what did you know you know so just to kind of pull this video together um they d they now know the biological parents of the child they know that he has siblings, but they still don't know who murdered this child, and they don't know who had him for the four years of his life. He had only just turned four years old, just before he died. Like the family member of Betsy said, she believed that the adoption was handled privately by a private Catholic group. Now, I don't know if records were kept. I'm sh I would assume, since they were able to come up with a birth certificate, if this was an illegal, legitimate adoption, I'm sure that there is some record of that somewhere. And this could have been a private adoption at that time. We've all seen, we've all heard the stories, and we've all seen this play out um, that babies were often bought and sold now if you remember in the original story when the the little boy was first found dead um, now there was a man who worked at a lab he worked at a clinic or maybe the morgue I'll have to go back and check the the files on that but he told everybody that he had an, he had contacted a psychic to try to find out who the child was and what had happened. But in reality, he had gotten a tip from someone who said that they believed that the child was linked to a local foster home. And this was kind of what might be considered a group home. They, they for a long time, the police believed that the woman... Uh, the man and woman who ran this foster home that their daughter, her daughter, her biological daughter and his adopted daughter who he later married, which is just very strange, but they believed her to be the child's mother. The link to the foster home could be a possibility because once the child was adopted, Keep in mind, they, the girl in the story said that the child had developed mental problems. It's very possible that all of these stories are true. It's very possible that Betsy gave birth to the child. He was put up for adoption or sold, whatever, however you want to look at it. And the family that maybe took the child ended up 
not wanting him. Maybe he was too much for them to care for, or they found out that he wasn't perfect. So maybe they put him in this foster home. Maybe he went to this foster family or this group home or whatever it was, and maybe they turned around and sold the child to this Martha's mother, this librarian, who she claims kept the child as a, a basically just an abused victim. Now, none of these stories may be related. The story Martha told may not be true in any way, shape, or form. When the child was found dead in the box, they made a likeness of him. They actually took actual photos of him. And if you remember, they actually took his actual corpse, his actual dead body, dressed him up, and put him on display for people to walk by and look at him to see if anybody could recognize him. They said that people came from all over the country to, to check out this child to see if they thought there could be a possibility but that it could be a missing child from another part of the country. And they fingerprinted and they tested him against other missing children. Somebody out there knew Somebody out there knew something. I mean, of course, the killer knew. The person that murdered the child and put the child's body in the box, they knew. The only other thing that I can say is that the child's body was reburied. He was moved from the potter's field. is just a term that's used for like a cemetery for people, of, you know, of no means. Uh, who can't afford really a, a headstone and that type of thing. Unknown people. The child's body had been buried there, but he was moved to a cemetery, gotten a new headstone with his name, Joseph Augustus Sorelli. And um, he had only just turned four years old, uh, just within a very short period of time before he died. And that was really the only updates that I have been able to find. A lot of the stuff that's being put out on the on social media is amateur sleuth. Um, and, and some of these people have done a good job in investigating and, and coming up with names of who these people were. But the police are now, what they're focusing on now, is trying to figure out where the child was living, who had the child for those four years, and who had the child in the last weeks of his life. They've been able to kind of come up with um, some stuff, but they're not making it public. In the um, press conference that the police gave, and I'll try to find that video and put it in the comments, I'll pin it. He was able to, the detective that was up speaking, he was able to tell exactly the neighborhood where they believe the child lived. Um, there may still be a few people around who were young children or, or teenagers at that time who remember a family who had a small child. I don't know how they were able to kind of come up with that unless adoption records were kept and they were able to kind of create a um, profile of who the family was that adopted the child. But did this adoptive family have him that whole four years? It's still a mystery as to who murdered him. And She died in 1991. He died in 2014. And according to his family, there was never any mention of this child. They had no idea whether he knew of the child's existence. It's reported here in the story, but I'm sorry I couldn't get it to open but that the two of them actually may have lived in the same neighborhood after they went on and, you know, went on with their married lives and, and raised their families, whether the two of them ever had any contact with each other after the child's birth, if she ever informed him that she had had a child, there's no way to know that because they both are dead now. She died from lung cancer, and I guess he died. He was 87 when he died. Please say at this point in time we are not going to be releasing any more information. Joseph has a number of siblings on both mother and father's side who are living. 
and it is out of respect for them, but Internet Sleuths came up with the names pretty quickly. They were able to find the birth certificate. Um, I don't know if the, the, there was, they, they said the child's name was Joseph Augustus. It says here that police say the birth certificate will be amended to reflect his name. The child's body was moved from um, to the Ivy Hill Cemetery where he was given a new headstone with his name. In 2017, Justin Thomas bought a DNA activation kit for his girlfriend from Ancestry.com. Thomas and his girlfriend broke up before she used the kit, so he decided to try it out. Justin learned a little about his family's heritage, but didn't give much thought to the rest. Four years later, he received a phone call from a forensic genealogist working on a cold case in Philadelphia. Thomas convinced his mom to provide a DNA sample to aid the investigation. Justin said he was shocked to learn that the boy in the box last name was Cirelli. He speculated that Augustus was likely his mom's first cousin. His grandmother's brother was a Cirelli. Thomas revealed that the Cirelli family lived in West Philadelphia before relocating to Delaware County. Justin told the Philadelphia Inquirer, Now that I have two young daughters and seeing his pictures and hearing the story, I'm really upset about it. It strikes home. It's horrible. I can't imagine. I want everyone to talk about it in the family, to try to understand and figure out what happened to this child. Um, the announcement only closes one chapter in this little boy's story while opening up a new one. This is an active homicide investigation, and we, sti we still need the public's help in filling in this child's life story. The police say they have suspicions about the person responsible for Sorelli's death, but didn't release information on the suspects. Um... They're offering a reward for information leading to a re resolution of the case. Sixty-five years after his death, he finally has a name. I want to thank everyone who worked tirelessly from, two, from 1957 to give him back his name. However, the search for justice continues. I hope to one day have more answers on this because it's the child, you know, he deserves his story to be told.